Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Ball Nine Roundhouse. Once again, we have a group of returning guests and a couple new pretty cool guests as well. So I would like to go around. I want to introduce. First, we have the food guy, Michael Torres, right here. How's it going, man? Good, good. good man. No complaints. Good. That's always good. We have Kevin Kern, America's most beloved sports writer here, too, as well. We Also, we have our ombudsman, Rocco Constantino. What's going on, man? How's everybody doing? Living the dream, brother. Living the dream. Right. We have Co Colin Cernelia up top. At least he's up top on my computer. <laughs> I'm up top on mine, too. Happy All to right, be here. Good. good, man. Thanks for coming around. Colin just wrote a book, Culture of Excellence, What We Can Learn from the Yankees About Leadership. So that's coming out September 15th. I'm really looking forward to that one. And last but absolutely not least, we have Jim the Rookie Morris. Maybe you know him from such movies as The Rookie or from his new book, Dream Makers, which is absolutely incredible. I just finished it. Mr. Morris, thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, man. Absolutely, man. It's a pleasure to, pleasure to have you. So, basically, with Colin and Jim, your books are about leadership and about being the best you can, surrounding yourself with the best. So I wanted to touch on leadership in Major League Baseball in general and is it failing the players? Is it failing the fans? Um, I just want to, you know, from Manfred on down to the managers, I'm curious to hear what you guys think about what's going on. It's such a strange season. And uh, Jim, I'd like to start with you. You know, I'm just going to put this out there and if they like it, they like it. My deal is I think we need to take politics out of baseball. Let's have baseball be baseball. It's been around with us through wars, recessions, depressions, and everything, civil unrest, all of it. And it stood the test of time. Now in 2020, it's standing a test of no fans allowed. But it affects so much more than just the fan. Yeah. The people who work the concessions, the people who work in the t-shirt souvenir shops, and the, everybody else. But we're not talking about that because we're talking about, oh, they busted out of their bubble and now they're going to be sent down somewhere. And I guess they're going to beam them somewhere. I have no idea how this works anymore. And it's very tough. So politics need to go out and we just need to play the game because you know what? It is a game and let's not make it more than it is. It's a baseball game. And as kids, we played for a hot dog and big leagues, they play for a lot more than that. But let's talk about all the minor league teams and kids who can't play now and chase their dream because we, we don't have any money. We're not going to play. So my deal with leadership is run your teams and don't worry about other people. Take care of yourselves because the only thing I can control in my life is me. I can't control any of the circumstances or anything around me. All I can control is me. And so if you don't have that leadership built up where we're on the same plane and we're trying to accomplish the same thing and you're trying to win a championship, whether it's shortened, lengthened, or anything in between, do the right thing. I think that's a great that's a great answer. And Colin, I mean, as you speak about leadership as well, I was curious about to hear your thoughts on this as well. Sir, and you know, Jim, I think you said it. But it's a game, right? And and I think that's what we always need to remember when we're trying to think about all the different scenarios. And I've never tried to since this pandemic started. I've never tried to pretend that I know more than the experts or uh, that I know more than anybody in Major League Baseball. Even, uh, I mean, I'm almost positive that every single one of them in leadership positions from Manford all the way down wants to play baseball, wants to be as safe and as healthy as possible. Um, you know, it's just, it's difficult right now. And, and I think we're seeing that, you know, in the NBA and the WNBA where they have a bubble and they're able to control things a little bit more, we're not having to worry about, you know, for example, this weekend, the whole Yankees Mets series getting canceled because we had a positive test. And now we're already in a sprint in comparison to a, a regular 162 game season. And now we're, we're less than, uh, we're, we're less than a month and a half away from that September 27th end date. So you're talking about putting more stress on these players and it, as much as you want to be romantic about baseball and just say, you know, it is a game, it is hard with all the other moving pieces because they're human beings, just like you and me. They deal with everything that's going on in this outside world and they don't have any of the answers either. So 
it's it is a mess um i'm glad there is baseball i don't know that i would have done any better if like <laughs> i was in manford's position for example but uh, there's no doubt in my mind that they wanted to do the best that they could um I, I just wonder if maybe they waited a little bit too long to to pull the trigger and start this season because i think it's causing a, a little more issues than maybe they anticipated that's a great point that maybe they're trying to just stuff 10 pounds of you know what, into a five pound bag. <laughs> so, uh, Kevin, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this as well. Well, you know, I slam Manfred a lot for what he does, but I, I can't, on this one, I think he's, he's, he's done it pretty good, you know, and uh, um, the leadership here, I, I've been saying all along they're going to get the season in, uh, and I think they're going to go hell or high water and get it in. I know the Mets had a situation, but, you know, there's still some guys that maybe, uh, you know, I'm hearing rumors, still some guys going out, doing some things. And uh, that, that comes down to personal responsibility. I think there's something like 27, 26 teams that haven't had a, a positive thing. But, but I think leadership is so important in other ways. You know, they're going to get through this no matter what. And, and, and I think we, we are too as a country. And uh, what Jim said there, I think, is so positive. We can't put we can't put politics in every freaking thing. I'm tired of it, you know. And and, and that's why we love baseball. Like one of the things, when I got excited when I heard Jim was on the show today because, you know, I, I've seen the movie, we've all seen the movie, yeah. and, and coming into he, you know, he came into a different culture. So I have a, a couple quick questions I got to ask. Him Go for it. Go for it. Uh, uh, Jim, two things. It seems to me like you were the original driveline. You 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 started throwing harder. How did that happen? And and and, and when you did get there, did you feel any part of that was because the Rays were trying to do some different things? Was any any part of that like a, a gimmicky type thing, or were you were you all in right from the beginning, knowing that hey, they're, they're, they're hiring me because of my talent? You know, I, I talked about this with like Roberto Hernandez and Ozzie Dean and Fred McGriff and point blank, they just stopped me mid sentence and they're like, if you couldn't do what you were here to do, you wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. And you throw 98 when you're 20 and have 85% of the muscle come out of your arm. And then at 35, throwing 98 to 102, you know, I attribute it to a lot. It's in the book. Um, I have a lot of faith and I think some things happen, but no, I was there because I could throw hard. I mean, we were in Detroit, and Roberto knows Doug Jones really well, who was a reliever for Detroit, and he calls me over, and he goes, hey, why'd you get here? How'd you get here? And I said, fastball. He goes, throw the fastball. And that was basically the conversation I had with every guy who would talk to me on different teams. And it's just fun being a part of that camaraderie because while you're doing – and living every day, you're getting to go out there with the best of the best mm -hmm. of the best and compete every single night. And to put any of that into jeopardy and be stupid and go, I know better than medical science or whatever baseball's protocol is, and I'm going to go do what I want to do anyway, is ridiculous because you know what? You could slip on a bar of soap and be out of the game in half a minute. So let's do it the right way and let's set an example. People look at athletes and they look up to them. We can live up to or down to expectation. That choice is ours, but let's live up to expectation a little bit and hold ourselves high and go, you know what? I'm not only playing for my name, but I'm playing for my team, my hometown, my state, and we're trying to win a championship. Why would I jeopardize any of that? Well, and one, one quick thing on the fastball. I think more pitchers should do that now. Throw the damn fastball. <laughs> they're, they're, they're just going, uh, you know, they're getting behind. And then all of a sudden you get the 3-0 fastball that, you know, Tatis. And one quick point on Tatis from my point of view. Shut up. You know, the 3-0 <laughs> home run. First of all, it was a great piece of hitting. He went with the pitch. He wasn't swinging from his ass. And, and second of all, the, uh, the, what you talk about, I think, is right on. Your best pitch was the fastball. Throw the fastball. Command the fastball. If more guys did that, we'd have better pitching. Absolutely. Their big deal when I got up there with Roberto and everybody, they're like, you throw your best and they're going to bring their best and whoever has the best that night wins. He goes, and if you don't win that night, have a very short memory and come back tomorrow ready to go again. That makes a lot of sense. Michael, we haven't gotten to you yet. I'm curious to hear about your position on leadership on down. 
you know, I'm always like the oddball with this. I think, I think with Kevin, like Manfred's did a terrible job to a certain extent, but I think with the testing, keeping people safe, the bubble, I'm okay with it. I think he's done an okay job. I think the fan part of it should have, could have been done different. I think that we're in a position now where people can go to games, you know, I cheat a little bit. My wife's a nurse, you know, it, it is, a, we're in a better place. People are, you know, washing their hands, wearing masks. So it makes it a little easier. I think hopefully by the playoffs, we actually get there, but you know, it's just baseball, man. I, I, I agree with Jim where I think that a lot of politics have gotten in the game over the last probably five years, especially, you know, and I just, I just want to see baseball. I want these guys to have fun. I want their, these unwritten rules to go away. We're talking about a seven, nothing game last night and the blue Jays came back from seven down. So what if they just quit on that game? You know, where San Diego lost that game because because Tatis didn't take a swing. You know, you play the game till the end. Who, you know, who cares? If it's thirty to nothing. That's baseball. You don't want to give up runs. Pitch back. I hear you. I mean, I mean, you know, twenty-seven outs, unless it's a doubleheader now. And- Every time. Yeah. But so, Rocco, you've been sitting there quiet. I know you got something to say, buddy. Come on. Yeah, I mean, I just as far as leadership is concerned. I, in, I'm in a leader leadership position in my my work, um, and and I, I value relational leadership. That's my uh, leadership style. And I think for Manfred, it's all about his relationship. He has to balance a relationship with the players, relationship with the fans, a relationship with baseball history. And it's a tough spot that he's in. And I've been critical of him too. Um, but with the pandemic stuff, I'll give him credit on that. Um, you know, I've picked on him, too, just like Kevin. But um, there was a time when all these cases started coming out, the things with the Cardinals. And, you know, we were on one of these episodes, and I said I was – used to be 100% sure that we were going to finish the season. Now we're only – not maybe not so much. But um, And that was the general consensus, I thought. If you went on social media, people were calling for the season to end. But, um, you know, he stayed the course, which was admirable. And, um, and he, they've – battled through they're making it work he's being creative um that's another key aspect of leadership is you have to be able to think on your feet you have to be creative and they're doing that with the the seven inning double headers and i don't like it and people don't like it but they're doing whatever they need to do to get the games in and um you know in the end i think we'll look back and it was it would be a pretty admirable effort to get this whole thing in um on the point of politics i it's it's I talk to so many baseball fans and everybody says we need to get politics out of baseball and I don't and sports in general I don't ever come across anybody who disagrees with that yet everything turns to politics somehow I just don't know how it happens I don't know if it's marginal fans watching things and not being so educated and and bringing that aspect in but I mean we sit back a lot and think about nostalgic times and man I wish we can go back to the 80s the 90s the 70s the way things were then it's not going to happen uh let's just enjoy it the way it is hope everybody stays safe and just hope that leadership still always takes the consideration of all parties fans players management and things like that so Rocco you know you talk about you know finishing the season I mean with where we are now do you guys think we're actually going to see this thing through through a you know, expanded playoff and, and through through the end of October. I mean, what do you guys think about that? Jim, we'll start with you again. I have no idea, man. I don't <laughs> want to. I don't want to answer anything for 2020. This year yeah. sucks. <laughs> All right? yeah. Let's just get it over with. That's. But I'm glad. I'm glad you said it. I just want. This is what I want. I want when a reporter comes up to a ball player and asks him something that doesn't need to be answered because it has nothing to do with baseball to go no comment. Let's just play the game. That's why we're here. That's why people watch. That's why people listen. Play the game. Shut up and be the best you can be. That's it. I think that's fantastic. That's a perfect answer. Colin? I also don't know. I will say that I am far less optimistic than I was. I mean, you know, I thought the season was going to start in late June, early July. You know, I thought maybe we were going to have like 120 games or so. I I don't know. Uh, the one thing I will say after hearing everybody talk, <laughs> I mean, do you guys remember life before the pandemic and when people used to talk about how technology was making the world so fast because we're all connected and everything's moving 
lightning speed. The pandemic, like this virus, I think is moving 400 times as fast as, or oh, yeah. faster than technology. And I think that's why the, the whole leadership question is so interesting and so complex is because nobody's ever had to move this fast to make decisions this fast without knowing what's coming next. So it, it, it's all really interesting. And I have no idea. I'm hopeful, obviously, that the season gets finished, but I'm far less optimistic today than I was when it started. I am absolutely with you, Colin. And you actually bring up a great point is that, I mean, just, just having to adapt and kind of learn on the fly. I mean, this has never, this has never happened before. So, I mean, it's a first for everybody. I mean, this entire year is a first for everybody. In March, I was at spring training in Tampa. And all of a sudden, everything went haywire. I came home, and I've been stuck in this garage pretty much ever since. So, you know, Michael, how about you, man? I mean, you were at spring training, too. But, I mean, you at least get to travel for work a little bit. But I, I live here in uh, Florida, uh, yeah. right between uh, the Yankees and the Orioles, right in the heart of spring training. And, yeah, I was at a bunch of games. I was at the last game uh, at Yankee. the Yankees played versus the Braves before they called it. Um, and it's just different, man. I, I travel for a living, 225 flights a year. This year, I, if I see 50, it'll be a miracle. You know, I still travel a little, but everything's done over the computer. I think we can power through this because I think there's too much invested in it at this point. But we're going to see some weird stuff as we come down to the stretch. I don't think it's out of the realm now to, to say we're not going to see a triple header that is three, five inning games to make <laughs> up some. I'm serious. To make I up know, you never know. You never know. You know, they're going to have to get creative. And I've heard win percentage versus, you know, wins because not everybody's going to get the 60 games in. There's just not going to be a way to do it. And I think they have to rethink the playoffs. The NBA was the perfect example of how well the bubble works. And I think the playoffs should do the same thing. If you want to be in the playoffs, we're going to have to do the bubble. This is where it's going to go. This is who's going. And you're not going to travel a lot. And that's how they're going to do it to keep players safe and get to the finish line and have a World Series this year. I agree with you about the bubble. It's working, seems to be working pretty well for the NHL as well. So, yeah. I mean, if that's what they need to do, then that's what they need to do. Kevin, I'm sure you have an opinion on this. Yeah, get rid of the bubble. I'm tired of bubble <laughs> stuff. You know, and I'm, I'm going to disagree virulently with Michael here. Part of being, and I think it gets back to what Colin and Jim are saying. Part of this is about leadership and responsibility and personal responsibility. I know for a fact different players that I've talked to they had meetings with their teams and basically said, hey, don't screw it up for the rest of us, you know? And those teams that I know of that have had some of those meetings have not had too much of an issue or any of the issues. So so I think this is a test, and, and I think Jim uh, was talking about it a little bit, but the um, leadership comes in different ways, and it's not just – you can't just – we've become a country now where we just look for this amazing leadership instead of – how about taking some personal responsibility, make decisions, move forward, do what's best for you and your family, and, and also for your neighbor. Just do it. And uh, instead of thinking that this guy's the answer or this way's an answer, that's too much. So to me, the bubble is I, I have a big – I have a, my daughter has been a, was a teacher. She's a teacher for, uh, you know, 15 years. She's very big with the students on personal responsibility. And I think we need to get back to that as a country instead of thinking there's going to be some, some uh, you know, somebody's going to come and save us and do everything right or anything like that. You do the right thing. You move forward. And I, I, enough of the whining, too. I mean, I just may piss off some people, but, you know, obviously we lost we lost a great photographer to New York Post, Anthony Causey, to, 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 to COVID. So I'm not, I'm not downplaying it all at all. But we've been through so much as a country, world wars, this and that. We can get through this. We can move forward. And I think baseball, by not being in a bubble, and you guys can disagree with me if you want, but by not being in a bubble, it's trying to show us the way of, okay, this is how we get it done. I don't, I don't disagree with that either. So now you guys. Now, I, I pitched in the beginning when this started that there should have been a punishment for going, you know, some of these guys out to dinner, strip club, you know, casino. If you did that, your team's out. If we had that kind of rules in the beginning, then these guys wouldn't be doing this stuff. Or if they did, we'd have less teams to worry about because you'd already have four teams out, you know. But that's a, but the problem there, Michael, is then then you then then you're gonna have people whining about oh we got thrown out because of this guy, you're gonna have an appeals case. I think the, 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 the bar was set. You either, you either rise above the bar or you fall under the bar. And the teams that are, are, are going to, you know, the 
the Cardinals and all these teams that have the issues, the Marlins, they're, they're paying the price because they're going to play a ton of games. And, and uh, you know, there's Jim, I don't know, you, you've been there and everything like this, and you know what it's like to play a doubleheader, even if it's a, a seven-inning game, and it's going to wear down your, your bullpen and all the other things. So it gets back to my original point of we can't do everything for you. You have to do something for yourself as a team. And one thing I want to disagree with Colin, too, I'm not trying to start trouble here, but the Yankees, <laughs> the Yankees for their leadership, you tell me about, they've won one championship, as many as the Marlins, since 2003. Oh. So, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bottom line guy. Let's go. You know, if they had, you know, and this I was championship having, is gonna, having such this, a good day. This is going to be 27 <laughs> and a third if they win this one. But we saw what the Rays did to them over the weekend. So there's a lot going on here. I'm, I'm uh, sorry, guys. But, uh, uh, I, I, I can't. I can't even say anything bad about the Rays because Jim is here. Thanks a lot. <laughs> the Rays are just Jim, 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 change, change the subject. Jim. Look, I, look. I mean, you brought it up the other day, man. They, they, they have a hell of a player development system, and they. That, that's what it's all about. They know how to develop. They know how, how to mix. They know, how to mix. they know how to mix analytics and player development like nobody else in the league, and do it on a, a shoestring budget. Key. It's crazy. Here's the key: they sell the analytics, so everybody thinks, "Wow, it's analytics." No, it's not. It's <laughs> player development, and it's a little bit of analytics. But I've always wondered about this, and, and again, this is just me, but Dennis Quaid played you in the movie. Is that, the, is that the guy you wanted to play you, or if you had a choice of who to play you in the movie, who would it have been? I wouldn't choose anybody but Dennis now because he and I are such good friends. But I'll mm-hmm. tell you this. I met Jim Caviezel and his wife on a flight to New York, and he oh. looked at me, and he recognized me. I didn't even know that he, I keep my head down and I'm flying. I keep my head down. And he looks at me on the plane and goes, I almost got to play you. <laughs> and everybody knows who we are. And I looked at him and I said, dude, you're way too good looking to play me. <laughs> and, and then two years later, he plays Jesus. And I thought, oh, man, you could have had Jesus play me. <laughs> well, you know, I, I met Jim uh, a couple of years ago up in uh, Hall of Fame with Piazza. He's very close friends with Piazza. And he's an engaging, engage, and he, I think Dennis Quaid did a great job, you know, because I think he brought that, that whole Texas thing and all that stuff. But, but Jim would have been great playing you too, because he would have brought, a, he would have brought another, uh, another round to it as well. Yeah, he's an incredible individual. Hey, fellas, it's Joe Blow from Mudville again. This Fernando Tatis thing's got me rankled. Fernando Tatis Jr., Sr., it doesn't matter which one. I'm a little angry. You know what we say in Mudville, let the kids play. What do you guys think about this? Me, I don't think he can score enough runs anymore because pitching stinks. I'll hang up and listen, like always. Bye. All right, so, Jim, since you're the only major league pitcher on the panel today, I'm going to start with you. What if you come in, it's mop-up duty, 3-0, and Base is loaded, and you give up a grand slam on three and zero. What do you think about these unwritten rules? And, and, and you know, I mean, what would you do? I was also a baseball coach, so I'm going to go at it from both sides here. Perfect. He swings at it and he hits it. Hooray for him! And he went with the pitch. He drilled it. Great swing. And we don't know who's going to score how many runs because it's 2020 and. We have to leave a guy in for a whole inning, so we may give up 10 runs or a 10 spot here or there. On the other side of that, oh, yeah, the wow. next guy is getting chin music. I don't care. <laughs> and, and I'm going to send a message to somebody, and they can yep. scream and holler all they want to, but you know what? It is what it is. Baseball is a game, and it's strategy. And if you don't know where the ball's coming, that's better for me as a pitcher and better for my team. If your back foot is a little bit twitchy back there because you can't plant, that plays in my favor. And so, yeah, he's getting chin music, the next guy. And the next time we play the Padres, there's probably going to be a bruise on Mr. Tatis Jr. But (laughs) but it'll be from the waist down. I was never one of those guys. I'm just giving that. Both sides of it. I see both sides because – yeah, the score's a little bit out of hand, but you never know what's going to happen. And if the other team gets hot and just starts – I've seen people, Nintendo games, and just single after single after single, then a bomb, then a walk, then a home run. Yeah. And all of a sudden, a 10-0 game is 10-9, and you're fighting for your life. So 
Yeah, both sides, man. Yeah, he's getting chin music, but yeah, good for him. Well, I agree with you. Rocco, I haven't gone to you in a second. What do you think about these unwritten rules? You I, have, I, you know. I think that's a good take on it. I, I think you have to kind of compartmentalize it a little bit. I think there are some of the un, unwritten rules that fall into showing somebody up healing bases when it's 10, 12, 13, nothing. That's not a big thing. The situation with Tatis, I agree with Jim. Shoot, I watched the Mets bowl. Uh-oh. Seven lead. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, Rocco. Rocco, you, 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 wait, 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 wait. You, you totally froze, man. I'm going to have to ask you again. You're froze. still frozen. Yeah, right. you, you, Sorry, you, you, look like, you look like you're eating something. Hold on. <laughs> All right. Uh, all right. So I'll, I'll edit that. Ready? All right. All right. So Rocco, how about you with the unwritten rules, buddy? Uh, my part of the unwritten rules is there's so much nuance to them that you have to compartmentalize it. You have, you know, there are rules in place unwritten. I don't know. I hate that term, but you don't show somebody up. It's a professional courtesy. I don't think Tatis did that in that situation. A seven run lead is nothing. I watch the Mets every day. I watch their bullpen. Seven run leads <laughs> evaporate, especially in 2020 in an instant. Um, so swing away, that's fine. But the pitcher does have the right to um, to brush somebody back or to send his own message. Yeah, um, I think a lot of the out out you know outcries on social media are from people that might not know that the nuances of the game. People that played and coach and and things like that understand it a little bit more. Uh, but like Jim, I used to tell that to my pitchers, my coach. Did I freeze again? No, 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 no. He was just oh. waving. The, yeah. Damn it. All right, we get it. But I, I used to tell that to my um, players when I coached too, my pitchers when I coached college softball. The way I used to put it is if you buzz one, you know, and, and brush somebody back, that person, that player is getting back into the box and they're going to feel a little tingle in their knees. And that, that kind of – that's the way I kind of put it. And it, it's like Jim said, that back foot twitches a little bit and, and it, there's a mental game to it. Um, so long story short, unwritten rules. Yeah, there are some things that I think should be professional courtesy. Um, this I don't think was one of them, but it's all a part of uh, respecting. It's baseball etiquette. I do think there's a place for it. I'm not in agreement with all these people that say, forget all the unwritten rules, forget everything. Um, you know, I think there's a place for baseball etiquette and professional courtesy. Uh, right. But Tati, swing away. Go for it. That was great. I agree with you. Colin, I mean, and, and not just limited to Tatis. I mean, like, just unwritten rules in general. Just just quick thought on that. Yeah, in, in general, I think my thoughts on unwritten rules have evolved over the course of my time as a fan in baseball. Like, when I was younger, I think I was leaning more towards traditional views, and I think I've opened up a little bit. But it's for me, they're professionals, right? Like they're being paid to do their job. So I don't even know if there's ever even necessarily a situation where you could honestly say like somebody's showing you up or, you know, you shouldn't have swung 3-0. Like you're, you're supposed to do a job. You know, if, if you don't want someone swinging 3-0, I've seen this argument a million times, don't get to 3-0 on the, on the batter. But uh, I think one of the, the funniest things I heard someone compare pair this to is if you're up 45 points in a football game and somebody makes an interception they don't just take a knee you know they're yeah. they're gonna run it back until they get tackled <laughs> and they might even it might even be a pick six so um you know i i don't know that there is a right answer what i'm am curious about specifically with the 3-0 unwritten rule is who decided that was an unwritten rule uh, i know it's something that is new to the game because we were swinging less 3-0 back in the day but who decided that that was an unwritten rule I think the reason that we weren't swinging 3-0 back in the day is because strategically it made sense to managers and to players to take that pitch and say okay the pitcher needs to throw three strikes to get me out before they throw one more ball I'm going to get on base whereas now with analytics we're saying okay if he's going to groove one right down the middle and I can get four runs off of one pitch why not so that, that for me is, is another part of it is like who determined that three, and zero swinging three, and zero up seven runs is an unwritten rule. I, I don't know. <laughs> that's good. That's a good point. I mean, honestly, if the pitcher throws a meatball, of course you're going to swing away. I mean, yeah. how could you not, you know? Um, can I say that's something I thought was lost in this whole discussion? There's a difference between 
you know, like Kevin said, going with the pitch and taking a, a swing with runners yeah. on base and trying to add some insurance runs. There's meaning to that. If there's a game where it's 10, 11, nothing in the eighth inning and it's a three, three Oh count and somebody's swinging from their heels, trying to jack one into the upper deck, like, you know, looking like Cespedes is out there. Um, <laughs> that's a little different than what Tatis did. Um, and, you know, I don't know whoever decided that, but it was probably Bob Gibson <laughs> I don't know, back in the day or somebody, you know, Sal, Sal the Barber Magley buzzing somebody doing some, something like that in the, uh, with the Giants. But um, there's a difference, and, I, and there's a lot of nuance to it, and, and I think that got lost in this whole discussion. No, I, I agree with you. Uh, Michael, I want to ask you real quick. Greatest sporting event I've ever been to in my life was a football game. It was mid-2000s Insight Bowl, Minnesota Golden Gophers and Texas Tech. Uh, Leach was coaching Texas Tech. At halftime, the score was 34 to nothing, Minnesota. The stadium was empty. We had nosebleeds. We walked all the way down to the sideline. They lost that game by a field goal, 38-34, I think. Texas Tech came out and put up all those – you know, like, so at what point do you give up on a game? You know, we're saying my lead is big enough. I hate that. I hate all that unwritten rule stuff. There's certain courtesies, like Rocco said, that I think you have to respect. You have to respect the game. But he didn't bat flip it to the moon. You know, he hit the ball and he ran the bases. You know, he didn't, up, you know, one up the pitcher. I just, that's not for me. One question, I, since we have that, though, I do want to know what Jim thinks of Joe Kelly on the other side, because that's, again, yeah. unwritten rules. This guy gets suspended 20% of the season for not hitting somebody, you know? Um, my deal with Joe Kelly, and I think he's a talented, talented guy, but that's what he's known for. He's a loose hairpin trigger guy. But again, it's all strategy. And we've gotten so politically correct in this country that we have to apologize for every single thing that goes on. And I'm, I'm tired of it. I almost said a bad word. I'm tired of <laughs> it. You're, you're allowed. It's okay. On this one. Just go out and play the game. Let's go back to Tati swinging. No hitter up there is going, if I get a groove right here, I'm hitting the ball out of the park. Hitting is one of the hardest things to do on this planet Earth. If he hits it and he hits it well, if he hits a single, nobody cares. It just happened to go out of the park. He didn't know it was going out of the park. He just hit it. Let's get back to baseball and leave all the fringe people who were all stars back when they were five years old out of it and take the opinion out of it baseball players who get paid need to go out and play baseball and the coaches who get paid need to coach and we need to tune everybody out because they don't know what's going on i think that's fair and yeah. uh, that, you know absolutely kevin i'm gonna go to you on this real quick unwritten rules and then we're gonna go around with some final thoughts yeah two quick points on this since that the, the padres have hit four grand slams on four different days since yeah. then you know so that tells me why well, I, I wrote about it earlier this year that Players are going to have to find an emotional lift from within to carry them with no fans. And I think this is a great thing for baseball because it gets us all talking about baseball, right or wrong or whatever. So I'm all for it in every way. Totally agree with Jim. These pitchers, these dumbass pitchers, don't even brush guys off the plate anymore. I talked to Goose Gossage about it, and, and Goose said the exact same thing Jim said. And even Joe Kelly, you know, where he threw it, you don't throw at the head. There's places you go. So they don't even know what they're doing anymore. And, and, and my other point is, I also wrote a column on managers being nerd puppets. And they are nerd puppets. And how about Jace Tingler? He's, oh. given, a, he's given a take. He was the best hitter in baseball maybe right now, the best young town on 3-0 when, like, you know, these games are video games. What the heck is he doing? And then he doesn't d defend his player. Publicly, publicly. And the GM, because they both used to work for, my guess is, they both used to work for uh, the Rangers, so they don't want their Ranger buddies to be upset with them. Play the game. Like Jim says, stop making excuses. Stop with the political correctness. He hit a home run. He went with the pitch. He did a great job. His, his teammates have his back because they've hit three more since then. Grand slams. And they're playing the way they should play. And maybe this will teach some other teams, we have to do it ourselves. We can't rely on anyone else. Let's get the emotion. Let's go.
just uh, absolutely humbled to be here, Jim. I was a huge fan of your movie. Can't wait to read your book. Same with Colin, man. I, you know, I saw your book. I was so excited for you and the book. I'm glad you joined us today. You know, and for me, I just want to see baseball. I think there's a gap between old baseball and new baseball, old fans and new fans. And I've always been someone who advocates for kind of mixing it. You look at Trevor Bauer this week trying to wear the Joe Kelly cleats, and they won't. Like, that's the kind of stuff that I'm just over. Like, let him wear the cleats. Like, who cares if he wears the cleats? You know, who cares if this guy's got long hair, this guy's got tattoos? You know, let these guys be themselves, and I think that'll help close the gap between old baseball and what's going to be new baseball. You know, these guys nowadays have huge personalities, and they want to express themselves. Let them be kids. Let them play baseball. Absolutely agree. Rocco. Um, I don't mean to steal Jim's thunder or anything, but I do want to talk real quick about Dream Makers because it did have, have an impact on me. And Colin, sorry, I didn't read read your book yet. It's not, but, it's not out yet. Um, so, <laughs> uh, perfect. So we, I'll get it then. I didn't read either. books, but um, <laughs> but we, we talked before the recording started, and, and Jim's book Dream Makers is, is fantastic. I read it and I shared it uh, uh, with the coaches that I oversee as an athletic director on the college level. Uh, our football and women's basketball coach ordered it. They've talked to their teams already about it. And it's funny, we have conversations. There's a two chapters in Jim's book. One's called Dream Makers. One's called Dream Killers. Um, and there's a story in there about the athletic director that Jim dealt with as a coach. Oh, yeah. I'm glad that I am not that person. And <laughs> coaches can verify that. But it's funny, you know, I sit there having this conversation with these um, my coaches and say, all right, this person's a dream maker. This person's a dream killer. And we kind of identify how people are in their office. So it's been pretty cool to see people. I really enjoyed the book. And there's always that thing, if you like a book, a song, a movie, and you share it with somebody, and then they enjoy it too, and share it off with somebody else, it's rewarding. So that was the effect Dream Makers had on me, and it's already being shared around. Um, thanks again, Jim, for sharing your story. Absolutely, Absolutely Rocco. And Kevin? Final thought. I'm sure you have something. Yeah, the, uh, I want. I can't wait to read both the books. And um, you know, I, it, it, as for Dream Makers, I, I think what's important with Jim here is here's a guy who was a, you know, he had different goals and he achieved them and he didn't stop. He's doing other things. I think that's a great lesson for 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 everyone. And the second thing I want to say is, I talked to Dwight Gooden, and you know, everybody knows about Dwight's problems, and, and I wrote about him this week and what he's doing and how he's like using family text to kind of get them through each day now and things like this. But we also talked about the 86 Mets. And he said, he said three words I think all players should understand right now. He said, they hated us and they was the opposing teams. That's what we need to get back to in baseball. Play for your team, play hard. And if the other guys don't like it, it's on them. So, this home run is on the Rangers. Look what's happened to the Rangers. And I'm very good friends with Todd Frazier. I guarantee you, Todd Frazier's in that clubhouse, and he's one pissed off player right now. He wants that team to come together. So I think this is the best thing that's happened in baseball in quite a while. And uh, hopefully it builds off it just like Jim built off his career. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Colin, I'm going to go to you. Cool. Final thoughts. I... Colin, tell us about your book. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, first, I, I will echo... Uh, what Michael said, I think that if baseball opens up a little bit more, it just opens up to the idea of being more open. I think a lot of the, just in our conversation today, how many different things we are talking about and some of the differing uh, opinions that we have. Uh, not that everything's got to be streamlined and everything's got to be lollipops and rainbows, but yeah, the game should be fun. And, and I think that if Major League Baseball as an entity opens up a little bit, we, we can get to that point. Uh, Jim, it's an honor to be on the same show as you. I think your story just beautifully illustrates what life is really about. Uh, you have done so many different things. You've reinvented yourself so many different times. And so many you know, younger kids that I work with, they see life as this linear you know, growth. You just go straight line. You're supposed to figure everything out by the time you're 22. And it just doesn't work that way. And I think the more people who hear your stories and see what you've done with your life, it, it's a really good representation of how, not just how happy you can be, you seem very happy, um, but how many different things you can try and how long this life actually is, uh, not just to box yourself into one thing. So um, 
again, an honor to be on the show with you. And real quick, my book, Culture of Excellence, uh, What We Can Learn from the Yankees About Leadership comes out on September 15th. It is available for pre-order on Amazon, Barnes & Nobles. You can get it from my company's website, www.talent409.com as well. I'm uh, super excited about it. It's been a three-year journey to get it out. And I know we have a few book writers on this panel, so I'm sure they can relate to the euphoria that you feel when you get to the finish line. And I'm excited for it. That's awesome. I'm looking forward to ordering. I'm going to pre-order it. And Jim, Thank you. absolutely. I mean, you're up. Oh, Colin, I can't wait to read it. I'm going to pre-order it as soon as I get off with you guys. Um, Kevin, you have a hairline like mine. I love it. Um, <laughs> living it, baby. The dream maker aspect. I think if we just we take that and we move it into baseball or, or basketball or football, and we take the best of the best, and we look at loyalty, and we look at character, and we look at integrity, and we look at people who want to be the best teammate they can possibly be. Because I'm on this team right now, right here, 2020. Let's go do what we got to do. And then we don't have a Cleveland situation where I'm bigger than the game and I have a big personality. So I'm going to go do whatever I want to do and you're going to deal with it. I think that was handled properly. You're not going to play for a while. See ya. Because right now, right here, life is real, man. This year sucks. <laughs> and so let's go out and be the best teammates we can be for each other because right now our loyalty needs to ride with whatever team we're on. And if we start winning and people don't like it and I hit a 3-0 home run, come back and do something different. Try to win the next game because you know what? We're coming right back at you. If we get that going again, baseball, which has seen us through so much of our democracy, is going to carry us through this also. And it's going to carry us. This is one of the – this is the greatest game I've ever seen in my life because – Every individual has to do their job to make the team work. It is the biggest and best chess match on the planet, and I love it because of that. Do your job. Do it well. you got a big personality. Talk about whatever you want to off the field, but in between those white lines, it's baseball, man. Let's go do it. I love it. I think that's great. <laughs> and, uh, you know, now is the time where we go to Rocco Constantino, the ball nine on Buzzman, who likes to tell us what we screwed up along the way. <laughs> So um, I really don't have uh, anything to clean up today because it was mostly, you know, people making their opinions um, on certain things. Just a couple stats on the last round of testing with COVID. Um, 12,000 tests were done in that um, the testing period, which was one week the last time baseball released them. So it looks like baseball is doing about 400 tests per week. And that last one they released, it was only one team that had two positive players, two positive staff members. So it was a 0 0.03 positive rate. Play ball, let's go, let's hope the Cardinals situation was the and Marlins were the major problems that they had to deal with. But it looks like we've, we've dealt through that and moved forward. And like Jim said, let's play ball, get out there, play baseball and and cut all the bullshit out. I like it. Amen. I like yeah. it. Well, gentlemen, I want to say thank you. Michael Torres, Kevin Kernan. Colin Cernelia, Robert Casentino, and Jim Morris. New book is Dream Makers. Check it out. I finished it the other day. I might read it again. It's that good. I want to say thank you, guys. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Absolutely. And this has been the Ball Nine Roundhouse.